The Case Files of Dr. John H. Watson The Brixton Mystery No, A Study in Scarlet Sherlock Holmes had already explained that what was out of the common was usually a guide rather than a hindrance. When solving a problem of this sort, he said that the best thing is to be able to reason backwards. So, I'm going to look back over all the notes that I've been taking throughout the case and see if I can work out how he did it. Now this was a case in which we were given the result and we had to find out everything else for ourselves. Or Sherlock had to find out everything for himself. Now I'm going to try and show you some of the different steps of his reasoning. First of all, he approached the house on foot, and with his mind entirely free from all impressions, he naturally began by examining the roadway. He saw the marks of a cab, which, ascertaining by inquiry, must have been there during the night. He knew that because of the rain. The narrow gauge of the wheels meant it was a cab and not a private car. So that was his first point gained. Walking slowly down the garden path, I noticed that he found the heavy footmarks of the policeman. But he also saw the track of the two men who had first passed through the garden. That would have been easy to miss. Their marks had been entirely obliterated by the others. In this way, his second link was formed. The nocturnal visitors were two in number. One remarkable for his height, calculated from the length of his stride, that must have been Mr. Jefferson Hope, and the other, Sherlock said, was fashionably dressed, judging from the small and elegant impression left by his boots. That would have been Mr. Enoch Drebber. Upon entering the house, this last inference was confirmed. The well-booted man lay before us, which meant that the tall one had done the murder, if there was a murder done. There was no wound found upon the dead man, but Sherlock said that there was an agitated expression on the man's face, which assured him that he had foreseen his fate before it came upon him. Having sniffed the dead man's lips, a rather strange move, I thought, Sherlock said he detected a slightly sour smell, and then came to the conclusion that the man had been poisoned. And now came the great question as to the reason why. Well, he worked out that it was no robbery, for nothing had been taken. What about politics? Political assassins are only too glad to do their work and then run away. Hmm. A private matter? Once the inscription was discovered upon the wall, he was more certain of that. When the ring was found, however, it settled the question. Clearly, the murderer had used the ring to remind his victim of some dead or absent woman. It was at this point that Sherlock Holmes asked Inspector Lestrade whether he had inquired in his telegram to Cleveland about any particular point in Mr. Drebber's former career. Lestrade said that he did not. Sherlock then proceeded to make a careful examination of the room, which confirmed his opinion about the murderer's height and gave additional details as to the Trichinopoly cigar and the lengths of his fingernails. It was amazing the details that he managed to find out. Having left the house, Sherlock Holmes proceeded to do what Lestrade had neglected. He telegraphed the head of police in Cleveland, inquiring to the circumstances connected with the marriage of Enoch Drebber. The answer was conclusive. Drebber had already applied for the protection of the law against an old rival in love, named Jefferson Hope, and that this same Jefferson Hope was at present in Europe. Sherlock Holmes now held the clue to the mystery in his hands and all that was left was for him to secure the murderer. He had already determined in his own mind that the man who had walked into the house with Drebber was none other than the man who had driven the cab. And supposing one man wished to dog another all the way through London, well, what better means than by cab? What more could this man do in London than become a cab driver? It made sense. These considerations led Sherlock Holmes to the irresistible conclusion that Jefferson Hope or the J.H. that was mentioned in that telegram that was found, was to be found among the cab drivers of London. If he had been one, well, there was no reason to believe that he had ceased to be one. On the contrary, from Jefferson Hope's point of view, any sudden change in his profession would be likely to draw attention to himself. 
Holmes therefore organised his street detective corps, winged by Wiggins, a most unusual move, and he sent them systematically to every cab proprietor in London until they ferreted out the man that Sherlock Holmes wanted. The murder of Stangerson was an incident which was entirely unexpected, but in any case could hardly have been prevented. Through it, Sherlock Holmes came into possession of the pills, the existence of which he had already guessed at. You can see now that the whole thing is just a logical chain of sequences without a break or a flaw. When Sherlock Holmes had put them all together, well, he had found Jefferson Hope and he had him in handcuffs straight away. It was quite incredible. It was amazing to be part of this study and incredible to watch Sherlock Holmes at work firsthand. I've learnt a lot about him and I'm sure that he learned even more about me. In any case, as he predicted, Lestrade and Scotland Yard ended up taking all the credit. Who knows, one day perhaps I'll be able to publish this journal and then maybe the name of Sherlock Holmes will be famous.